Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul's United Church of Christ this morning. No matter who you are or where you are on your life's journey, you are welcome here. This morning, I wanted to remind you to sign the friendship register form. And also in your bulletins, there is an envelope for the Neighbors in Need offering. That's one of the five special offerings that the United Church of Christ collects every year. And Neighbors in Need is exactly what it sounds like. It is for people within our nation who are um, in need of help, especially people who are um, needing help due to justice issues. So this year, some of this money will go to help refugees, but it also goes to help all kinds of local projects like um, taking care of congregations who uh, are trying to do ministries to feed the hungry and to clothe those who don't have clothing. So please take time to, to put some money in here or check if you feel so moved. And um, I would call your attention to the bulletin to any announcements that are in there that you might want to look about. We want to thank the Frame family for the autumn bouquet that is absolutely gorgeous this morning. And um, I would also draw your attention to the bulletin uh, prayer requests and cards. Please pay attention to those and hold those people in your prayers at different times during this week. And so now I ask that you would stand as you are able for our call to worship. This place for us is holy ground. The place where we sing songs of praise to the Lord and repeat the stories of faith that inspire us through songs of Christ's love. God called us here in whispering winds and burning flames and with his presence disarms us of the barriers we have placed around ourselves. Instead, Instead, God meets us in our vulnerability, our humanity. Let, Let us worship, worship the Lord. Lord. Please remain standing for our opening hymn number 559. We will sing the first verse only, <coughs> Here I Am, Lord. <coughs> Let us pray together. 
Holy God, like Moses, we run from our mistakes, yet can't escape you. Forgive us for the mistakes we have made. We see all the reasons we can't say yes to your call, yet can't convince you to choose someone else. Forgive us for the times we refuse you. We doubt your presence, yet the burning bush flickers beside us. In the presence of the holy, forgive our lack of notice. And please, for a few moments, let us notice what God calls to our minds. Dear friends, no matter what we have done or failed to have done, God knows us, God loves us, and God in God's graciousness forgives us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. We are forgiven. Praise God. Amen. And he decided to go a little closer and look at it. 
And God said, all of a sudden, he heard God's voice. And he said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am, God. I mean, that's what I, I would either run and hide or I'd say the same thing. And God said to Moses, and you have to do this with me. Take off your shoes. You won't? No, I don't have to take off my shoes. Take off your shoes. And for the place where you are standing, what's the end? Is holy ground. Isn't that amazing? That God saw to Moses that the bush was on fire, but it wasn't being consumed. And God said, take off your shoes, for this is holy ground. We need to remember today that every place that we walk, when we are aware of God, is also holy ground. Thank you. Oh, and I forgot we were going to collect an offering, and I completely forgot it this week. Well, we will do it next time, Miss Maggie. Okay, thank you very much.
Today's scripture is Exodus 3, verses 1 through 15. Moses at the burning bush. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it had not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great light and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come, no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for this place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on the account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians, and to bring them out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me, and I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come. I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship the God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and then they asked me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. Thank you, Patty. I always um, want to thank people who read the scripture when there are hard words <laughs> in it. <laughs> None of us would have known if you made a mistake, but I think you did it absolutely perfectly. So thank you so much for being willing to do that and to serve us in that way. Also, Jake, I want to thank you, or not thank you, but I want to say happy birthday three days from now. It's going to be your birthday. How old are you going to be? Huh? Oh my gosh, wow. seven years old. Wow. <laughs> and I want to thank our uh, music video producer, Becky. Um, yeah. You know, those songs, yeah. Come on. But, <laughs> the, um, it, putting the words on the screen to a song that was uh, done and coordinating it with the pictures and the singing is quite a feat. And we appreciate and thank you for doing that. Um, and I hope someday you don't have to do that, that we can all sing in person. That will be a day of blessing and glory for all of us, won't it? Except maybe for those of us that are singing. <laughs> so the Bible story begins in Genesis uh, with God creating order out of chaos and creating everything that is. In relationship with Abraham and Sarah, God promised that they would have descendants more than the number of the stars in the sky. And he brought life to the elderly barren couple, and then he preserved their son Isaac from being sacrificed. God then came down to Isaac's son Jacob, and promised him that he would be with him even though he was a scoundrel and he would bring him back to the homeland from which he was fleeing. At the end of the book of Genesis, the promise of descendants has been fulfilled 
but we find them as slaves in Egypt, not in their home land. Some 400 years later, we come to the story of Moses, one of those descendants of Jacob. Moses was born a Hebrew slave in Egypt. He narrowly escaped Pharaoh's order to kill all the Hebrew baby boys. He was adopted and raised by one of Pharaoh's daughters, of all things, in the court of Pharaoh, the one who had ordered the slaughter of the innocents. As a young adult man, Moses noticed that an Egyptian was beating one of the Hebrew slaves, his own people. And so Moses then grabbed that man when he thought no one was looking, and he murdered him. His very own people, the Hebrews, said, we know what you did. We know what you did, and we don't like it. And so Moses, fearing for his life, fled about as far away as he could get from Egypt. He stopped at a well in a country that was called Midian, which is far towards the east from where Egypt is. And he was identified at that well as an Egyptian, although he wasn't. And the woman who identified him was the daughter of the priest of Midian. Now the priest of Midian was not a, uh, a priest of the God that we know, but a priest of a little G God of that local location. He ended up marrying her and then he ended up working for that priest of a false God, taking care of his sheep. And, and so we get to the part of the story where he is far away from his people in Egypt and far away from their plight. Maybe he was really glad to be away from all of that mess. Years had passed, and although that one cruel Pharaoh had died, the next one who came along continued to oppress the people. And they groaned and cried out for help. And the Bible tells us that their cries rose to God. And the text tells us that God observed their misery, knew their suffering, heard their cries, and decides to come down to deliver them. In other words, God resurrects from a bunch of slaves from the Hebrews, his people, the nation of Israel, bringing them out of Egypt. Pure gospel, pure grace, wonderful, good news. And that brings us to the fateful day when Moses was tending sheep in the wilderness, far, far from home in the Sinai. Something caught his eye, a bush on fire, but not being consumed, not being turned to ash. Moses turns off his path for a closer look, and he hears a voice, Moses, Moses, come no closer. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you stand is holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And like Abraham before him, and Samuel after him, and Isaiah after him, and Mary of Nazareth after him, Moses replies, Here I am. Moses takes off his shoes, for he is standing on holy ground. And of all things, he and God have a conversation. The Bible is full of such conversations. There's the conversation of Abraham arguing with God and pleading with God to spare the faithful people in Sodom and Gomorrah. Mary questioning the angel Gabriel at the time of the Annunciation. Jesus begging God to take away the cup that he was facing when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Here is God, the capital C creator of all things, Yahweh, who is also as close as our next breath, 
God of all and God of us in relationship with us. We can push back and say anything and argue with God and not be consumed. Moses asks, who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. And God doesn't really answer him. He just says, I will go with you. Apparently, it didn't matter to God who exactly or what horrible things Moses had done, including murder. Moses comes up with another question. What should I say if I tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you and they ask, what is his name? I don't know what to say. You know, it's really an interesting question. From our perspective, we have seen the word G-O-D or the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in the Bible from the time we were children. So we have understood God from the beginning verses of Genesis. We know that Adam and Eve talked to God that Noah talked to God, that Abraham talked to God, and others spoke with God. And we can read some of the names that God was given by these people. Hagar, the slave, called God El Roy, the God who sees me. Abraham called God Adonai El Elohim, the God Most High, and also El Shaddai, God Almighty, and El Olam, the everlasting God, and Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides, Jacob wrestled all night with God and asked God for God's name, but still God didn't say it. And now generations later, for the first time, God finally speaks God's name. I am who I am. In the Hebrew, it is just four Hebrew consonants. Kya, he, va, he. The sound of breath inhaled and exhaled. As Father Richard Rohr says, the name of God is the first and last names or sounds that we humans make. When a baby is born, what do they do and what do we wait for? holding our breaths until they do it. <gasps> and the nurse says, he's breathing, she's breathing. And then we hear the huge cry. And the last thing that happens when someone dies, <sighs> the final breath, <sighs> Yahweh. God's name with us even as we God is who God is, and God will be what the future needs God to be. Well, Moses, in spite of that amazing name, came up with other questions, or we might say excuses. For example, the dog ate my homework. I'm, I'm just hoping you're paying attention there. Uh, he says, well, what if they don't believe me or won't listen to me? He says, I'm not eloquent, I am slow of speech and tongue. And then finally, at the end of his rope, from the deepest place in his heart, he finally pleads, send someone else. And God's response, I need you, Moses. Not Abraham or Isaac or Jacob, I need you, flaws and all, so that together, your people, my people, will be saved. Your brother Aaron will help you, but I need you. Sounds a little bit like Uncle Sam and the finger pointing. The questions that Moses asked out loud were, who am I and who are you? But I think if we try to get inside his head, we might imagine that he was asking, what could be different about the purpose of my life because of the reality of God? What could be different about our purpose right here and right now because of the reality of the great I am? 
The pandemic has laid bare some ugly truths about our world. Devastating environmental changes, systemic racism, a nation divided. It is obvious in these last 19 months that we 